Good evening, and welcome to the Crocker Art Museum. My name is Houghton Kinsman, and I'm the Adult Education Coordinator here at the museum. Before we begin, I'll read a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Crocker Art Museum is on the traditional, unceded land of the Nisenan people, and the current state of California is the homeland of many tribes. We are honored to be here today and acknowledge our responsibility to these Native nations and our commitment to work with them as we move forward as an inclusive institution. So thank you all for joining us here this evening. We're really excited to be hosting a wonderful presentation by journalist and author Kate Nelson in celebration of the museum's exhibition, Spirit Lines, Helen Harden Etchings, with works by her mother, Pablita Velarde, and daughter, Margaret Bagshaw. A reminder that the Crocker is open again, and you can reserve your tickets online at crockerart.org. Let us know in the chat if you had a chance to see the exhibition. Now, a few quick housekeeping notes. Um, this evening's program will be available to view again on YouTube. The link will be emailed to all members and program registrants. Please use the chat for any comments and for any questions you'd like us to answer. I also want to thank our members in attendance today for your continued support. Your support, along with those who have donated so graciously to tonight's program, and those of you who have turned up in your numbers to attend, is a constant reminder of the generosity of our museum community. So thank you all. Over the course of the evening, I'll be adding links to purchase, gift, renew memberships, sign up for upcoming programs, or browse our super cool online store. And because our host for tonight is Director of Education, Stacey Shulnard Hendrick, it would be remiss of me not to encourage you all to subscribe to our YouTube page if you haven't already. So go on, Stacey will be really happy. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage the Crocker's Director of Education, Stacey Shelnut Hendrick. Welcome, Stacey. Thank you, Houghton. I appreciate the generosity of the introduction. Thank you so much. How are you tonight? Good, good. How are you? I'm excited. This is our first program together. I know. Virtual program together. Yeah. I think the last time we worked together in person might have been for the Akinsanya Kambon. Um, conversation you did. That's right. And that's like a year ago, March. Wow. I must have done something <laughs> because you didn't <laughs> invite me to do another thing. <laughs> well, I did, I did want to ask, is this your um, is this you, your YouTube live debut, Stacey? It is my YouTube live debut. Um, and I'm excited. I, I think we're going to take YouTube by storm. I expect this to go viral any <laughs> day now. <laughs> I, I suppose I, I have to say thank you because in a way we're kind of taking over from uh, Rogue Book Club tonight. Yes. So the fourth Thursday is usually reserved for the official Rogue Book Club. Um, and we are truly excited to interrupt our sort of pattern with this amazing opportunity to have an author talk about their book for a full hour. We're very, very excited. So speaking of literature, one of the things I wanted to ask you because you know, being sat at home during the pandemic and wondering, you know, what to do with myself. I've been digging into the vast um, education and public programs archive. Um, and I've really been surprised about the number of programs uh, dedicated to literature that the department has put on over the years. So my question for you before we invite um, Kate to the stage is, you know, where does the interest come in engaging with this medium? And what are you looking forward to most about Kate's presentation this evening? It's so funny that you mentioned the archive because on my desk is the report that, <laughs> <laughs> that I'm, I'm digging through. Um, yeah, I think over the years, we've just noticed that a lot of people who love books and love literature and love poetry also love art. And so inevitably, when we have art conversations, it ends up talking about, you know, different philosophies and books and quotes um, from, you know, Po, po, excuse me, po, okay, poets. I can't talk today from poets. And so um, this has been uh, an opportunity for us to really just understand how, you know, the literary arts and the visual arts connect and oversect and have some intersectionality. So it's been fun to do that. And we're really excited for tonight. Awesome. Um, shall we invite Kate to the stage? Yes, let's do that. So um, for three decades, Kate Nelson has documented colorful and varied stories of New Mexico from her base in Sandia Mountain foothills um, near Albuquerque. Um, author of the biography, Helen Harden, A Straight Line, which I have, excuse me, A Straight Line Curve, which I have, um, which is a beautiful book. If you ever just wanted a book to own just to feel, this is the book. And then to read it is like, 
doubly and wonderful. Um, so she is the author of this wonderful book, but she's also the editor of the New Mexico Magazine, where her writing has won national honors. And so we're extremely um, thankful that she has joined us today. And so with that, yeah, let's get her on. Hey, Kate. Hi. Hi, Kate, how are you? I'm very well. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm disappointed that I can't be there. I've heard wonderful things about how well the museum has staged this show, and and I encourage everyone to get over there and see it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the show has 23 copper plate etchings by Helen Harden, and then it also has paintings by her mom and her daughter. Um, so it's a real, I want to say, diverse exhibition, but there's some commonalities that I think I saw and I think people will see, but some real interesting differences. Plus, the relationship between moms and daughters is always so interesting, too. Right? Oh, so interesting. <laughs> yes, so interesting. Um, with that, I don't want to hold us up. I think, um, Houghton, are you ready? Should we get started? Sounds good. Um, for everybody watching, just to let you all know that Stacey will be joining Kate back on stage after her presentation. So if you do have any questions for Kate, uh, feel free to put them in the comments section and I'll make sure that Stacey um, gets those over to Kate. So with all that said, enjoy. Thank you, Houghton. Um, I'm honored to, to have this uh, place in your homes tonight and would like to make a couple of disclaimers. I will be talking about Native American art. I'll be talking about Western history. I am not a Native American. Uh, nor am I a, a visual artist, and I'm not a credentialed historian. I'm an I'm a in, inevitably curious person who asks a lot of questions, knows how to dig through public records and private letters and compile them all together to tell a, a, a good tale. That's the person who's bringing you this tonight. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the ancestral lands of Tiwa and Karas people, whose descendants today live and thrive on San Felipe, Santa Ana, and Sandia Pueblos, just, just over the ridge here. These are the women that we'll be talking about today, but I plan to use their story to also sketch an outline of the evolution of Native American art. And so if I were being truly honest, the title of this talk would be Three Women, One Story, 1,000 years of Native American art and 400 years of Southwestern US history in under an hour. And that seemed too wordy. So um, we'll, we'll, I will get it all in there because the reality is I can't talk about these women without touching on major turning points in the production of Native American art and in the development of the West. Today, you're gonna hear about ancestral Puebloans, Spanish colonists, Indian boarding schools, tuberculosis, the Spanish flu, the railroad and the tourism empire of Fred Harvey, 1960s activism, and some ongoing struggles for artistic freedom and mainstream recognition for native artists. That's too much to cover in under an hour. So instead of a thousand years, we're only going to go back to the year 1200. Still pretty far away back. These, these next slides represent a few of the art forms that were prevalent among the Pueblo people of the Southwest around the year 1200, a few centuries before European contact. This is a petroglyph. You'll see some basketry and some pottery. As you look at them, the notion that abstract art was a 20th century phenomenon seems to ignore some other early influences. Terry Greaves, a contemporary Kiowa artist who lives in Santa Fe, says that the first abstract eye in America was an indigenous eye, and it was most likely a female eye. 1200 also represents the time frame that Tewa people, Tewa, T-E-W-A, people began building villages in the canyons and on the cliff faces of a region north of Santa Fe that's called the Pajarito Plateau. It sits below today's town of Los Alamos, the place where the Manhattan Project built the world's first atomic bomb during World War II. During this 1200 era, many Pueblo peoples adopted what's sometimes called the Kachina culture or Katsina culture in extremely broad terms. It was a method of spirituality that 
called on masked and costumed figures that represented various parts of the universe, rain or animals. Sometimes they were carved and painted into doll-like figures or statues. They became petroglyphs. They were painted on the walls of ceremonial kivas, the sacred structures on each pueblo. And certain men within the tribe would dress as those deities for ceremonial dances. All of this will face threats, including erasure in the coming centuries of Spanish and Anglo settlement. One of the tribes, the Tewa tribes on the Pajarito Plateau created what's known today as Bandelier National Monument, a great place to visit. You can climb down pine pole ladders and up to cave eight dwellings that were carved out of the cliff face. The Santa Clara Pueblo people had a similar village, this one, it's about a ridge or two over called Puye. And this is what it looks like up on the ridge top, just a great view of the Jemez Mountains in the distance. This is a place you can visit as well, or we'll be able to again after the pandemic, pandemic on a tour guided by a Pueblo member. It remains an important spiritual place to the Santa Clara people and by extension to Pablita Velarde for whom this was a very important anchoring site. This is the Kiva you can climb down into at Puye. Pablita's ancestors left that cliff face and the mesa top during a drought in the 1500s and settled on the banks of the Rio Grande where they are today. They continued and continue today to hold their most sacred ceremonies back up at that Puye site. In 1541, the first Spanish conquistadors wandered through what's now New Mexico, followed by Spanish colonists, and not even a drought could compare with the, the changes they brought with them. Besides a new language, a new religion, new types of government, the Spanish brought new art forms and new materials for creating art. They brought silver, sheep's wool, cowhide, Sometimes they even had canvas and oil paint. That, it was a long way to get it up El Camino Real from, from Mexico City to Santa Fe. This marks the first major shift from art such as petroglyphs and pottery to the development of what we know today as traditional native art. It includes the extraordinary silver work and weavings of Navajo people, the beadwork of Apaches, and a new emphasis on a, a decorative caliber of pottery among Pueblo peoples, a different caliber of, of decoration. On Santa Clara Pueblo, pottery was traditionally created by women, but painted by men. And this distinction is important for us to remember when talking about these three painting women. On Santa Clara, and on many other tribal lands in the Southwest today, women are not supposed to paint. This proscription was lost on Pablita, who I think it's fair to regard as something of a feminist icon well before her own era. This is Pablita, she was born in 1918. New Mexico had been an official US state since 1912, but she was not regarded as a US citizen. Native peoples would not receive that recognition until 1924. They were not granted full voting rights until after World War II. Think about this time of her birth, 1918. <clears throat> the world is on the brink of war and a global flu epidemic that together will wipe out half of the world's population. The flu in particular has a disproportionate impact on tribal peoples. And it is particularly cruel to the older members of the tribe, those people responsible for maintaining the culture and teaching it to the next generation. These people are disappearing. That's the world that she is born into. The flu took the lives of her parents' first four children and eventually Pablita's mother as well. Globally, it will create famines refugee crises, a need for major advancements in public health unseen since the Civil War. Already New Mexico was a haven for people suffering from tuberculosis and will become even more so 
during this new surge of public health care. The thinking back then was that dry desert air at high elevations will cure TB. You and I know that only penicillin will cure TB, but they didn't have penicillin back then. Um, a lot of people think that with the opening of the Santa Fe Trail around in the 1840s, that that was the start of West of Anglo settlement in the West, but it really wasn't. Those were just traders coming through, going back, coming through, going back. The real influx of Anglo settlement, at least into New Mexico, began with the railroad's arrival in the 1880s and with it then the creation of TB sanitariums all over New Mexico. So those are bringing more people in. Those who survive decide to stay. The Fred Harvey Company, which built hotels along the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe tracks, at one point drove its lodgers from Santa Fe to the Puye site where it had a concessions building and Santa Clara artists could sell small pots and the like to the tourists. These were called the Harvey Detours. It was, that marked a part of the development of Indian art as craft and inevitably to its mass production as trinkets and kitsch. It emphasized giving people what they want and it segregated craft from pure art, but it also created a form of economic development for native peoples of that era. Um, Pablita could remember going to that site with her, with her aunties as they sold their, their pottery there. She's just three years old when her mother dies and it leaves her father whom she adored and was very tied to a grieving widower with four daughters. And the best idea he has for coping is to put the three oldest girls into an Indian boarding school in Santa Fe. It's one of the schools that were created across the nation to quote, kill the Indian, save the man. They were designed to wipe out any tribal distinctions between various people and force them to assimilate. Their hair was cut, they wore uniforms, they went to church. They were not only required to speak English, but often punished if they used their tribal languages. Pablita is six when she starts at the school. She's lonely, she's scared. She's experiencing an extreme sense of isolation and alienation. And she's smart enough to realize that all of that is happening to her. Many years later, her daughter, Helen Harden will say, my mother grew up angry. As tough as the experience is, Pablita excels. As she's entering her teen years, she has two saving graces. One of them is a white woman named Dorothy Dunn. She has, is starting the Indian painting school at the boarding school. Serious Indian art had received its first wave of national attention in the 1920s and Dunn aims to build on that. She pulls students into the class and encourages them to paint the things they remember of their lives back home. Today, there's a fair debate over whether she forced onto her students a colonial mindset of how Native people should paint. Um, you often see that flat painting style, as in this photo, um, um, ledger drawings and things like that. Rather than exposing them to the wide world of art and seeing what came from that. But she's also acting in a somewhat revolutionary manner. This school is set up to erase these tribal cultures, and Dunn is inviting the students in to document them. And in a certain way, she's helping to preserve those cultures through the art that these students create and leave behind. In Dunn's five years at the school, 1932 to 1937, she not only trained Pablita, but people like Alan Hauser, Ben Quintana, Harrison Begay, Pop Shelley, the list goes on of people who became the gold standard of traditional native art. The other saving grace Pablita found at the boarding school was an artist named Tonita Pena. She was part of that 1920s wave of, of nationally acclaimed native artists, and she'd been hired to paint some murals inside the Indian school. At that point, Pablita was seeing a Pueblo woman who's being paid money to paint rather than just the pottery that remember only, only men could paint, 
but also Tonito is from San Ildefonso Pueblo. It's right next door to Santa Clara. They spoke the same language. She became something of a mother figure to this motherless child, but also a model of what a headstrong girl of talent might be able to shoot for. Pablita's fellow students were putting her through the ringer for being a girl creating art. It's one of the hurdles she'll have to, she'll have to smash through, um, but Tonita's there to, to help her. At one point, a project Pablita gets to work on is, is painting other murals on the art school's walls. She eventually becomes the first person in her family to graduate from high school. After leaving the school, Pablita gets a nanny gig for the daughter of the writer and artist Ernest Thompson Seton, one of the founders of the Boy Scouts, who takes her uh, with her, he takes her with his family all across America on a speaking tour. And it's an opportunity few Pueblo people would get other than by enlisting in the, the military service. Coming home, she gets her first paid artist gig with the WPA, creating paintings for Bandelier National Monument. Oh, this is a picture of her with Helen. I probably put this out of order. Um, the WPA's impact on New Mexico art and architecture is enormous and it's cross-cultural. In some ways, the WPA helped save traditions like Spanish colonial art and Navajo weaving. It also provided a living to artists like Pablita, other names you might recognize, Gustav Bauman, Peter Hurd. When the WPA gig is over, Pablita comes back to Santa Clara Pueblo, where she's facing some scorn from tribal elders for this painting habit she's picked up. But with her earnings, she becomes the first woman on the Pueblo to build a house of her own. She is not the docile native woman sitting on a blanket selling her little pots to railroad customers. Pablita is smart, educated, somewhat worldly, and a little scratchy. The one directive she's given from tribal elders that she does follow for the rest of her life is that she is not to depict any of their sacred ceremonies. The public ceremonies that you and I could go to, fine. But the, the ones with the kiva and all of that, no, she can't paint those. Within her adherence to that edict, you can see in her kind of the push-pull relationship that she has with the Pueblo. She loves it there. She lives there off and on for the rest of her life. But the place also drives her a little nuts. And one of the first places it does so is with the birth of her first child, Helen Harden, in 1943. Um, Pablita had fallen in love with Herbert Harden. He was a white man who worked security for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They got married and then spent the next few years largely saying goodbye to each other as World War II breaks out. Their two children are born during that time, first Helen and then later Herbert Jr. Here's the problem for Pablita and Helen. Santa Clara Pueblo had, then and still today, a ban on awarding tribal membership to children of mixed marriages. If the father was the parent who wasn't a Pueblo member, if it was the other way around, a Pueblo man marrying a non-Pueblo woman, their children would have tribal rights. So Helen and Herbie are denied tribal membership, even though as children, they, they spend most of their early years on the Pueblo. It's the first language Helen learns to speak. They're not allowed to attend the most sacred ceremonies and it becomes the first brick in Helen's own sense of alienation. Pablita's marriage isn't a happy one, but her art career finds footing in these years. The family eventually moves to Albuquerque where her paintings are spread across the dining room table and often farther. She's dragging the kids to Indian art shows across the Southwest and she starts winning big awards. In 1953, she's the first woman to receive the Grand Purchase Award from the Philbrook Museum in Tulsa. She's included in a group show at the Smithsonian. In 1954, she receives the Palms d'Académie Award from the French government. She wins numerous first place awards from the Gallup Intertribal Ceremonial. 
She writes and paints the images for a book, Old Father Storyteller. This is the painting that appears on the cover for it. You can still find the book here and there around. And in it, she relates tribal stories as told to her by her father. At this time, she's working mostly in casein and watercolor, but starts experimenting with earth pigments. She grinds down rocks and turns them into paints for works that beautifully evoke the traditional scenes she depicts. She becomes quite famous for these earth pigment paintings. And overall, her paintings are becoming more complex with more characters, a surer hand, and even a bit of abstraction. And we'll scroll through a few of them here. That's an earth pigment. Another one. Yeah, I love these. It's so sweet to see art again. Just got to break and say that. Um, she soon moves into her masterpiece era and becomes one of the most beloved Native artists in the nation. There's still at this time something of a trading post mentality to the marketing of Indian art. You might get a show in a mainstream gallery, but you won't get year round representation in one. Indian art is still regarded as a, a kind of a novelty act, and the monetary rewards reflect that. You can make a good living, Pablita made a decent living, but you're not going to get rich, and you are going to work hard for every penny. But the 1960s and 1970s are coming, and with them is Helen Harden coming of age. She has had a disjointed relationship with her father. The marriage had broken up and he'd moved away. He's a truly decent guy. He's just absent a lot and has some um, odd issues with women. She's been denied Pueblo membership, but when she's in Albuquerque, she's regarded as an Indian. With whatever 1960s era prejudicial coloring that comes with. She has a sort of one foot and two worlds dislocation. She and her mother on a personal level veer between loving on each other and fighting like cats. Um, with her brother Herbert, they're traveling with Pablita all over the West where Helen begins absorbing the experiences of tribal peoples from all over North America. Denied an opportunity to learn her own Pueblo's traditions she starts developing her own ideas of native spirituality. And along the way, she's also learning one of the hardest lessons of an artist's life, marketing matters. Helen swears she'll be anything but an artist when she graduates from a Catholic high school in Albuquerque and soon learns that she's ill-suited for almost anything else. She tries college, she drops out. She tries retail, she's lousy at it. Art becomes one of the ways she can reliably make money. Her earliest works are largely derivative of paintings that her mother makes. She spent time roaming Puya Cliffs during various ceremonies and art shows. So you see petroglyph imagery crop up. The work shows she has an eye and a hand, but they're mostly dutiful to what came before. This picture, this one, this painting has an interesting story. When Helen was 17, still in high school, she was sent to an Indian art workshop in Arizona that ended up becoming the, the foundation for what's now the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Um, when the program ended, she called Pablita and said she didn't have money for a bus ticket home. Uh, 17 years old, alone in Arizona. And Pablita, who's who's not who doesn't have much extra money herself, tells her, you know how to make money, make a painting. And this is the painting that young Helen makes. And that image of a little girl sort of trapped between two koshares, the, the, the clown figures from a, a native ceremony, one representing good, one representing evil. Um, it's very evocative. And yes, she sold it and she got home. After, after high school, her personal life is kind of a mess. She's hooked up with a handsome, tough guy with whom she has a daughter, Margaret. He will be in and out of both of their lives for the next 10 years until he's killed in the parking lot of a strip club in Albuquerque. Along the way, Helen is beginning to find success independent of her mother. 
She's living with her father in Colombia, Bogota, Colombia, when she has a solo art show and for the first time is able to sell her works to people who've never heard of Pablita Velarde. She returns to New Mexico with a burst of confidence and an incomparable public persona. She is the coolest chick around. It's the late 60s, stuff is happening all around the globe, and Helen acquires this fever to be original and to be the best. She's studying Picasso, Kandinsky, Mondrian. She's immersed in the psychedelia of the era, the visual psychedelia. She does not take drugs. And she's out exploring regions that have pottery sherds and petroglyphs, puts it all in a blender, and outcome works like these. This is an image of the Avanyu, and that's a water spirit that appears a lot in Southwestern native art. It's, it, it's a desert, we, 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 we're always praying for rain. And this is a close up of it, and you can start to see some of the layers of detail that, that she embeds in her works. Um, in the middle of this, in the middle of the water serpent around it, you see something that looks like a kachina mask. She's often playing with that sort of imagery. And at one point, the Santa Clara Pueblo elders get on our case for painting kachinas that you can only see in sacred ceremonies. Her response is essentially, hey guys, remember when you denied me entry into the sacred ceremonies? She's just making it all up. This is her brand of native spirituality. She is a compulsive perfectionist in how she presents herself and most especially in her work ethic and all these minute details that she labors over in every painting. Photos don't do them true justice. I encourage you to get to, go to the exhibit and try to get your nose as close to the glass as the guards will let you and, and start to experience that, that depth of, of Helen's work. She paints with acrylics because they dry fast so she can work fast. And because of that fast drying, she can keep adding layers, adding and adding sometimes scratching at the paint or burnishing it. When you stand before one of her paintings today, the surface almost looks like a lacquer or, or a diamond finish on a lowrider car. It's a two-dimensional painting, but it's not. Um, Helen quickly becomes part of a new vanguard of Native American artists, and it includes the likes of R.C. Gorman, Fritz Scholder, T.C. Cannon, Tony Day. Together, they're kind of the mod squad of carrying out Native art, carrying Native art out of its specialty category and in, into mainstream. And they're not doing so without controversy. A question that was raised, even from Pablita, even as she's adding some of Helen's abstract details to her paintings, is this. Is it still Native art? if it's not traditional native art. Back then this debate raged, it continues to be raised today. Nevertheless, Helen, Helen persists. She begins angling for higher prices for her work, sometimes to her mother's dismay. She seeks representation in mainstream galleries, she gets it. She's riding a wave and doing it backwards and in high heels, but it's costing her. In the late 1970s, she finally relents to the pressure to create the prints that you see in this show and thus get paid several times over for the same image. When she's introduced to the copper plate etching process at El Cerro Graphics, the results are, oh golly, that's a beautiful pairing. Um, from this first set of images, which were begun in March 1980 to the last that was completed in June 1984, these prints reveal an extraordinary range. The stripped down imagery, like in this one, to highly stylized and thought through masterworks. The process totally suits her nose to the grindstone process, um, with the added requirement that she has to do it all backwards, you know, printing. Um, she puts a severe limit on how many prints will be made from each plate. She's been concerned in the past by fellow artists who mass market their works to a 
tote bag extreme that she finds distasteful. She drives the printers to their wits ends, experimenting with papers and inks to achieve her idea of perfection. Some of them take months to get to that point where she says, yeah, this is good. The three most renowned of these prints are the women. There's Medicine Woman, Listening Woman, and Changing Woman. Changing Woman is a native deity who's tied to many tribes' creation stories. Um, sometimes she's used today during puberty rites for young girls who are being introduced to what will be expected of them to uphold their tribe's traditions. There's a lot of ways of telling the stories and I am giving you, I'm glossing into one of them just to give you a feel for it. The stories usually have her appearing at dawn as a young woman who then goes through numerous struggles. She sometimes gives birth to other deities like Monster Slayer. By day's end, she's an old woman who looks to the east and sees her younger self coming to meet her. And in that way, she's always being reborn. She's the changing woman. I love what Helen said about why she created this women series. And it references the works of R.C. Gorman, who was a dear friend of hers, but she did not appreciate the way he depicted women. What she said was, I thought that in other series of women I had seen by Indian artists, Gorman has been doing his women series for years and years. The emphasis had always been on the body, on the hands, on the boobs, on the feet, and everything was usually massive and masculine. I felt women are not that way, or at least not only that way. Women are also intellectual and emotional and sensitive. And that's what I wanted my series to be about, an intellectual series. My women do not have big boobs. My women have big brains. In 1981, Helen is diagnosed with breast cancer and it is bad. She goes through the mastectomy, through the treatment. She continues painting. She continues with the etchings. And out of this come her greatest masterpieces that you will see in this exhibit. On June 9th, 1984, she succumbs to the cancer at just 41 years old. Left behind was her mother, Publita, who would have two more decades of art ahead of her, and Margaret, who was at that point thinking she might become a physician. She'd seen the rigors and hardships of the artist's life. She was super smart, headstrong, and a weird relationship with her father. And if that all starts to sound kind of familiar and inevitable, you're probably right. Margaret was raised between Pablita and Helen's homes and often said that her first memory as a baby was the smell of paint. So maybe it wasn't in her genes, but it was in her nasal canal. She was dealing with insomnia during one of her two pregnancies when she picked up paint. It didn't happen overnight, but eventually Margaret will be part of the third Native Arts Vanguard that just blows the doors off the place. Pablita represents the traditional art ethos. Helen represents a mingling of traditional art with modern art and with mainstream representation. Margaret and her cohort absorb every influence, native and non-native, and put it all there on the canvas. Margaret saw herself not as a native artist, but as a modernist, whose work sometimes imbued elements of native iconography. She applied layer upon layer of oil paint, scratching it, combing it. At her peak, she's working on enormous canvases that she's absolutely coating in oil paint. It takes a while to dry, so she might have 10 canvases working at any one point. She would mix math and mysticism to manifest her own interior, interior world of katsinas, lanyus, pharaohs, feathers, and most famously, a chorus of women, their mouths opened in prayer, chant, or song. 
Margaret began her mother line series with a haunting portrait of three Katsinas representing herself, her mother, and her grandmother. It catapulted her popularity as well as her confidence. Big, bold paintings, elegant, ethereal, and a little saucy became her trademark. Oh, isn't that beautiful? That's a huge painting. <clears throat> now we just want to look at art. Um, in early 2015, she began acting strangely and soon fell into a health crisis. The cause was a brain tumor and the prognosis was, was awful. We brought her home. We showered her with love. And on March 19th, 2015, she passed. And she was just 50 years old. A decade prior, after winning nearly every accolade an artist could, Pablita Velarde had died at the age of 87. And I like to keep them all together here. I like to think that they're with us here today, listening in, probably correcting me on every other point as well. Yes, I hear you, Margaret. The world of Native art that these women left behind is alive and well and controversial and too often copied and mass produced. The Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe is turning out a generation of artists who roar. They are painters, sculptors, dancers, musicians. Even as tribal communities have seen the light and encouraging them their mainstream artistic endeavors, the manufacturing of fakes has gotten so good that laws protecting the native made label can't keep up. Trading posts still exist. Some of them are reputable, seeking out native artists who are authentically creating their own works and innovating their processes to reflect modern ideas. Others prey on native communities. They pay lower prices for easily produced items, often of inferior materials, and enable a poverty level experience for far too many artists. Annual Indian markets also still exist, and the best of them are juried affairs that encourage craftsmanship as well as innovation. They're a great place to ensure that you're buying the real thing. The Santa Fe Indian market, which started just a few years after Pablita was born, <clears throat> attracts 150,000 people every August and features some of the best native artists in North America. It was a virtual market last year. They're, they're planning to hold it in person this year with some limits on attendance, details yet to be worked out, but if you can come, it's, it's an experience. <clears throat> the biggest hurdle facing native art is the one that faces all art. Is there a market? Artists deserve to make money, but right now galleries struggle against internet sales. And we have a younger generation so strapped by college loans that they won't be buying much art for years to come. This could prove cyclical, and I hope it does, because in the end, we need art. We need beauty. We need the interpretive power that artists bring to us about the times we live in. Before her illness, Margaret had prepared two masonite boards for her next works. And she was applying early layers of paints that looked to me similar enough that I thought she was working on a diptych. No, she told me they're headed in vastly different places though she held those destiny, destinies in her head alone. Whenever she painted, she often said, she could hear the voices of her mother and her grandmother, like the rustle of the ancients. Through her work, that was how she could communicate with them. Painting is our language, she wrote in her own memoir, used by and understood by all three of us. We communicate past to present, present to past, they both left unfinished paintings on their tables. What was left unsaid? Margaret's Masonite boards remain behind as well, forever unfinished. In some other realm, I like to think that perhaps the details are being filled in, 
And that conversation of these three women continues. It's kind of harmony bouncing from canyon to clouds and back. Two months after Helen died, a magazine in Albuquerque published a remembrance of her. In it, she recount, the author recounted Helen's response to a question about how she wanted her art to be remembered. Forever, Helen said. I hope you get to come to this exhibit and help make Helen's wish come true that her work be remembered forever. I think I was muted. Was I muted? Yes. Oh, okay. So I was saying something brilliant. <laughs> what I was um, asking was, I'm struck by the fact that you completed this book, what I, I would say relatively fast, um, six oh. months, but you immersed yourself and wrapped yourself in not only the, um, I want to say historical data, but also just the fabric of their lives and how it was interwoven um, together. How, can you talk a little bit about that process about approaching a artist um, or family of artists from a journalistic point of view versus an art historical point of view? It was it was a daunting when when Margaret and Dan first came to me with, with this idea. I didn't I hadn't done much arts writing at all. So that was a little scary. And I had six months to do it, and I had a full-time job already. Wow. Um, so it was a lot of evenings and weekends work. Um, I was greatly enabled by the fact that Helen kept incredible scrapbooks of press clippings, of, of letters from, from friends and family. There was a, a, a delicious cache of handwritten letters between her and her mother when she was living in Bogota, Colombia. And, and that's where I could read the love between the two of the women. As much as they often clashed in those letters, they were just missing each other. Um, yeah. I, I dove into interviewing anyone who had been a friend of Helen's um, and learned a lot about the um, unreliability of memory. Um, there, was, there was one friend who told me a fantastic tale about being out in a place called the Gallisdale Basin with Helen and they're hunting pottery sherds and there's this woman in a long black dress appeared and yes, it was Georgia O'Keeffe. Mm -hmm. And I was so excited, what a great story to, 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 to include in the book. And I went back and told Margaret about it and she said, you know, I think mom would have mentioned that at some point. So there was a lot of having to vet yeah. Is this, a, is this a good memory that I can include or an untrustworthy one? Um, because of that immersion and that time frame, um, I sort of got the sense after a while that I was walking with Helen. Um, I, I go for a lot of hikes um, here at where I live and um, new paragraphs would come into my head fully formed, um, the title of the book came to me during one of those hikes. In addition, my visual perception was, was greatly increased. I was seeing this place I walk almost every day in a, in a wholly different light. It was a really sad experience when I turned in the final chapter mm -hmm. and had to accept, oh, I can't go walking with Helen anymore. <laughs> Well, um, we have a major fan base. Dan and a couple of other people are just like amazing, Kate. Wonderful job, Kate. Um, I definitely echo that. I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask one question for um, the Crocker's docents because they, you know, are really excited to offer tours and interpretive programs around this um, exhibition. And so the one thing I guess I would like to end with is if, people go to the exhibition and they learn nothing else, what would be that one thing you would be really upset if they didn't know once they walked out of that show or even listen to this talk? What's the one sort of takeaway you'd like people to have about that family? I would hope that they, they 
let themselves into at least one of the works, whether it's one of the prints or one of the paintings that are supporting it, and feel this unbelievable confidence that these women had to break a rule, do something that they knew was right, and carry that with them. It's okay for us too to stand up to stand up and say, yeah, I'm gonna do something that I know is right and beautiful because it's mine. Ownership and making their own way, that's an amazing legacy that they've all left us. And so thank you so much. I appreciate it. I wanna remind people that if you have not had enough of Kate's um, eloquence and um, amazing articulate self please get a copy of the book uh it's it's i've read i haven't read it all but i've read parts of it and i find it really um just as eloquently as you've spoken it's written that way too so um it's a true treat and it, what i also love is there's wonderful pictures um that are alongside the illustrations of the artwork um and so you get a really wonderful behind the scenes view of the family in very informal um you know natural settings and so that's a nice thing that you get to see that you often don't get to see in the art books you know so yes. it's nice that you did that uh any last words for you i don't want to cut you off too soon um, just deep gratitudes to to both you and houghton for making this possible and to the museum for making this exhibit a a, a real and living thing Yes, it's a beautiful exhibition and I hope people get to see it. It will be up, let me just double check the, um, it'll be up through May 16th. So it's not, this is a call, a sense of urgency, you know? I think in COVID time, things feel like, you know, everything's moving in slow motion, but this is not, this is like less than a month <laughs> um, <laughs> to be on view. So definitely get a chance to see the show. Kate, thank you so much. Um, I think Houghton, you and I have some closing remarks that we need to make. Kate, thank you so much. We appreciate you joining us. Um, for those out there who um, want to learn more and see the exhibition, please come to the Crocker. We would love to have you. Um, I also want to just say um, this is the official World Book Club, um, I want to say time of month, uh, the fourth Thursday. It is a um, wonderful interruption that we had today with Kate, but we go back to our normal process next month where we'll be reading um, for Mental Health Month, May. Um, we're talking about Marvels, a sort of uh, illustrated journal by cartoonist Ellen Forney. So please join us for that. We would love to have you um, at the Official Road Book Club. Houghton, are you gonna come back? <laughs> Oh, now you're muted, Houghton, saying something brilliant. <laughs> there we go. So just to say thank you to you, Stacey, and of course to Kate and for everybody in the audience who joined us here this evening. Um, we're going to play out with a wonderful montage of um, images from um, the three women, and then um, we hope to see you all again soon. Thanks, Houghton. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Kate.